Monroe liked the story, but what really drew her to the project was the chance to finally have kids, on screen at least, to explore the maternal feelings that had been thwarted by a history of miscarriages and abortions. Monroe's own childhood had been excruciating. Abandoned by her father, her mother confined in a mental institution, Monroe grew up in foster homes, 12 of them by the time she was 14. She played these scenes from Something's Got to Give with a vulnerability and a tenderness that seemed to draw from her own orphan-like past. You don't remember me, do you? No. I do. Don't pay any attention to her. She's crazy. Are you going to stay long? I don't know yet. Um, would you like me to? I don't I know where you would sleep. I don't know either yet, but if we could work that out, would, would you like me to stay? I would. I wouldn't mind. She was very happy about working with the children, yes. They were nice, nice little youngsters, too. If her, one of her babies had lived, it would have been about the si age of the youngest. And that, uh, I think, emotionally was very tender to her. Here I go! <laughs> she identified very heavily with the orphans of the world. She wanted to, to take care of children, you know, to get rid of the way she was taken care of and to, to take care of children the way she would want to have been taken care of. Oh, I think absolutely. Absolutely. Timmy, let me go. Oh, Timmy, you know, far away in the South Sea Islands, when a man hurts himself and he doesn't want people to see, you know what he does? What? He has somebody else cry for him. How does that help? You'd be surprised. Can I cry for you? Yeah, silly. I'm good. I'm okay now. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess now, being uh, 38 years old, uh, and looking back, I think she would have made a very good mother. Christopher Robert Morley was seven years old in 1962. He's now a stockbroker on Wall Street. I'm just sorry, in retrospect, that uh, I pulled away when she wanted to console me. But I do remember when she uh, knelt down to help me out of the pool that she was very, uh, very tender and very consoling. And in the fantasy world of being on the movie set and shooting the movie, it was very, very nice to have Marilyn as my mother. Alexandra Heilweil was just four years old when she was cast as Marilyn's daughter. Thinking back on it now as an adult, maybe she was wistful and didn't want to get too involved with us because it was painful for her in a way, not having her own family. Now a scientist living in Florida, Alexandra's brief encounter with Marilyn left a lasting impression. And I think to this day, she's the model that I have of femininity, of she was just beautiful and it was her poise really, not so much her face or her figure that, that made her so beautiful, that the way she carried herself and the way she moved and spoke was, was utterly feminine. <laughs> I used to come see your mommy, too. She drowned. You ever think about her? Once a year, I do. Once a year, I do, too. Only once a year? We take flowers to church on her birthday with Daddy. You put those flowers under that window? Which window? Doesn't she have a stained glass window there or something? Oh, that one. I think so. I forgot. Daddy said we're going to get a new mommy. He goes, really? Bianca! Do you like Bianca? So many people are afraid of being vulnerable. She wasn't. She was, uh, she was vulnerable. You know, uh, I, I would well up in tears sometimes. When I, and I, and in fact, I've, I must admit that I've, I sat there and, and cut a sequence and I was crying. Because there's, if, if, if it's honest here, I'm an honest guy. If that film is honest, I'm going to react to it, believe me. Timmy, come here. What? I want to hug you. Me too! <laughs> you two, both of you. <laughs> you know what you two kids are. What? You're my two sweethearts. My two best sweethearts in the whole world. <laughs> hey, you little rascal. <laughs> 
Cut it, go on. Here we go. You can get up. The encouraging voice you hear in the background belongs to George Cukor, one of just 12 directors that Marilyn Monroe told 20th Century Fox she would work with when she signed her contract with the studio in 1955. She liked Cukor, in part because he was patient and gentle with his stars. Marilyn, who went through agonies of anxiety before shooting a scene, needed all the support and friendly feedback she could get. She was just fearful of the camera. So fearful, in fact, that Monroe would throw up on the morning she was scheduled to shoot and linger in her dressing room as long as possible, avoiding a scene. The lips that would come on and the lips that would go on. I'd get her at 6 o'clock, she wouldn't be able to get to the set before 11. After each day's work, Monroe sought reassurance from editor David Bretherton, the first man to sift through the dailies and see how she looked on the screen. So she had me look right in her eyes and say, was I all right? And I said, God, you were marvelous. You wouldn't, you wouldn't just say that. And I said, no, you know me well enough to know that I wouldn't just say that. I said, no, it was absolutely beautiful. And I, I really meant it. Cukor, well aware of Monroe's fragile confidence, was extremely supportive. When he could get her on the set. On May 1st, Monroe arrived at 7 a.m., only to leave at 7.30. Another morning, she nearly fainted under a hairdryer and had to go home. She had sinusitis. She had a virus. She lost her voice. She was suffering from exhaustion. Insomnia had become a nightly ordeal. Cukor did the best he could to keep the production rolling. He shot around Monroe's scenes, keeping Dean Martin, Sid Charisse, and the rest of the cast busy. Martin was called upon to do his end of Marilyn's famous nude swimming pool scene by himself, throwing a robe down to an empty pool as a flat-voiced stand-in read Monroe's lines. When you're all finished, come on in. It's very refreshing. By May 10th, she had missed 16 of the first 17 shooting days. A studio doctor confirmed her virus and ordered her to stay in bed. But studio nerves were beginning to fray. Cukor had shot everything he could without Monroe and was forced to shut down the set. That was a daily worry of everybody. You come on the set, sort of joke in the morning with your coffee and donuts. I would ask, is she here? Even before we started, the big question was whether Marilyn Monroe would show, whether she was really up to and willing and wanting to participate in making a movie. The amount of time that was uh, spent on trying to get her on the set was something that was almost unbelievable. I mean, uh, the patience that the crew and the, uh, especially the director and I'm sure the, the head office uh, had uh, were extreme. And they, they, went, they went through hell trying to get it on film. And I would call three doctors every day. One was her, her nose man and eye man because she had sinusitis and she was afraid of all of that, and I told you. And then, then she had a, an internist. And then, of course, her, her analyst. I mean, she had enormous problems that came with the territory. And the studio was naive to think that this wouldn't happen. I mean, if the picture was budgeted for an eight-week shoot, they should have budgeted for a 16-week shoot. Because they wanted a film with Marilyn Monroe. But there are certain people, you, you create films, you don't manufacture films. I mean, you're not putting Elvis Presley in front of the camera and shooting it in six weeks. You have a very, very different persona. And I think that was the miscalculation, and I think it became um, aggravated because of what was happening with Cleopatra. I'm convinced of it. Jeff, Jeff, come on. Monroe finally reappeared on the set on May 14th. When she returned on the 15th and 16th, filming at last seemed to be on track, although progress was painstakingly slow. This welcome home scene between Marilyn and the family dog, a 15-second sequence, took a full day to shoot. This time, however, the delays weren't Marilyn's fault, and she seemed to enjoy doing take after patient take as the dog kept blowing his cue. Come on, get, 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 speak, speak, get, speak, get, speak, come on, get, speak, speak, come on, here, boy, come on, speak, watch it, speak, speak, boy, speak, speak. Come on, Jeff, come on, put your feet well, up. Uh, speak, speak. I used to come here a long time ago. <laughs> he remembers me. Kippy. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, come on, get over here, come on. 
Come on, Jack. <laughs> the dog was sensational in rehearsals. I've never seen such a good dog in rehearsals.